given you a grandfather to treat. Uh, two years ago, uh, Daniel Sonkin was here at our conference, and he has made a review of Ricardo and Jerry Tello's famous book, it's famous in America. The title is Family Bible when you're a grandfather to three. Uh, two years ago, uh, Daniel Sonkin was here at our conference, and he has made a review of Ricardo and Jerry Tello's famous book, it's famous in America. The title is Family Violence and Men of Color, Healing the Wounded Male Spirit. And Daniel Sonkin says, Family Violence and Men of Color is the best book in cross-cultural issues and domestic violence that I have ever read. Ricardo, your wisdom and knowledge is very clearly anchored in your many encounters with people in difficult life situations. And if I'm not very mistaken, that will also be reflected in your presentation today. The fascinating and personal title of your presentation is Fire and Firewater. Please, Ricardo. Thank you. In our traditions, <clears throat> I am a mestizo man from the Americas, meaning the fatherland was the conquista de Mexico, the Spanish invasion of Mexico. And the mother was la madre tierra, Tonatzin, uh, that suffered severe violation during that period of time. We have found, and I have found personally, that the healing of my story and the healing of the many people that I serve and I work with has to be done not only biologically, not only psychologically, not only socially, but also spiritually. So I want to join with you in prayer for the work that we all do together. This is a Pautecan song, Texas area. <clears throat> People there are part of our National Compadres Network. And it says very simply, strong wind, strong mind, strong heart. Tazo, tazo. Walking with the women. 
And I think our struggle in this field, or certainly in the United States, is that tension between the male and the female, between the genders. Uh, when there is gender equality, there's not so much of a struggle. And in the old ways, in the, tr in the ancient traditions, we knew that. We knew that about balance and rhythm and harmony. We knew that about men and women working together. And we also knew that it was our job to attend to the South, attend to the innocent, attend to the children, attend to those spirits that had not arrived yet. And the elders, some of us are already snow-capped, some of us already no-capped, I see everybody wants to look like Pear. So I know he's a rock star. So I'll be there soon enough, Pear. Next time, maybe I'll be looking like you. Not too sure. So, the east, the west, the south, and the north. And in the center, very important for us, in the center where Mother Earth, though not seen, meets Father Sky, though not you. Tonali, our soul, blends with all of the energies, and we need that. So an old African prayer, I think, tells it very nicely. Uh, we pray for the children that they have a long way to go. We pray for the elders because they have walked a long way. And we pray for us that have to take care of them both. So in community, I want to introduce myself. My name is Ricardo Antonio Enrique Carrillo Chavez Santisteva. <laughs> but I thought my name was Pendejo. <laughs> Estúpido, baboso, no sirves para nada. Stupid, worthless, good for nothing. That's the kind of home I was raised in. The violence was so severe and so threatening that when my father beat my mother and broke her bones, the sound would go through my body so that I, as a man, for many years, felt like I had no backbone. And those of you that have been victims of violence understand that intimately. You know what it's like to be terrorized. You know what it's like to be frightened. You know what it's like to be powerless. My father was an immigrant from Novela Sonora, from the desert in, uh, in between Arizona. Before there was a border, there was no border. Uh, when we were uh, Yaki, and when we were Papago, and when we were Pima. And that's the land my father came from. And he worked the mines. And when my dad, when my daddy was a young man, he was a nice man. He played the guitar. That's where he left me, his legacy. He was very romantic. He loved his mother. He loved his mother. His mother loved him. Youngest of five. Talented and gifted. But that's not the man I met. That's not the man I grew up with. The man I grew up with uh, was, a meth, uh, was a methamphetamine, actually an amphetamine addict. Now in 1960 in San Francisco, they sold uh, heroin, marijuana, or what we call weed in those days, and, uh, and liquid pharmaceutical amphetamine. Not the stuff that they make today, polluted with all kinds of toxins and oils and all kinds of uh, things, but liquid pharmaceutical amphetamine. So the guys that used that were fairly psychotic. There were men who were very strict, lost their mind, extremely violent men. That was who my, my dad uh, hung around with and who he sold these scripts to. My mother, on the other hand, who's about this big, not even five feet tall, four <coughs> feet something inches, was the one who really protected us from these kind of men that came around the house. And so there was one guy who had kept coming to the house, and my mother uh, said, you know, leave, I don't want you here. And he said, no, I'm here to see you, Richie, and you know, I need to see him. And uh, my mother uh, was really the strength of the familia, and I don't know where in the world the notion came that Latina women were passive, submissive, uh, obedient. My mother certainly wasn't. In fact, she was the one who tried to make sure that uh, we understood what strength was about. So she chased these men away. And when they didn't get the message, she'd open up the window, fill a pot full of hot water, and throw it you know, outside. 
I said, let that lie. You know, go away. But this guy kept coming back, and he kept coming back. And one day, my mother said, okay, no entiende, he doesn't understand, okay. She filled a pot of cold water, walked down the stairs, opened the door while I was standing at the top of the stairs, and threw the pot of water in this guy's face. And uh, he took the water, pulled out a pistol, and pistol it. And I watched her as her skull was cracked, as she started to bleed from her temples, get taken to the hospital. Three days later, my brother and I were sleeping in our bedroom. And we woke up in the middle of the night and the house was on fire. And my father was screaming at the top of his lungs. And I was nine. And I said in my little boy's brain, I've got to save him. I've got to get to him. I've got to find a way to get my dad out of there. And I didn't make it. I didn't get to him. He stopped screaming. And I knew he had died. So, I turned around, woke up my brother, and I said, we got to get out of here. And we didn't make it from here to the doorway to get out of the house. The smoke had overcome us. We woke up in the hospital in oxygen tents where it was cold, coughing up chunks of carbon. My mother looking at us with bandage around her head. And uh, she was crying and was happy and we were okay. And I asked her, how's Poppy, Mom? And she said, oh, he's okay. He's okay. He's okay. And I knew she was lying. And so that's how I became the man of the house. That's how I learned my journey around the issues of fire and fire. So I learned quite well from my father and men like my father how to be chemically dependent, how to be domestically violent, how to be, as Sal Mnuchin says, a successful failure. Have you heard that? Any of family therapists in the room, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> successful failure. And so I was overemployed and underpaid. And I went to not one treatment program, I went to five treatment programs. So people would look at me and say, man, what is wrong with you? Why can't you get it right? Why can't you get clean and sober? You're married, you've got children, you've got a degree for Christ's sake. you got a PhD. Yeah, I also had post-traumatic stress disorder. And nobody in the field of substance abuse knew how to deal with that. Nobody in the field of domestic violence knew how to deal with that. And mental health, oh, well, oh, my. Trauma wasn't even in the DSM at that point in time. So here we are, a culmination of the field, and, I, and, I, and it's a good time for us. I think it's a good time. I think we have you now finally learned a few things about this process and learned that you know, not only are there comorbidities between family violence and uh, chemical dependency, but at the root of it, many of the people that we're working with are traumatized. And if we look at that situation, and we look at that problem, from that perspective, then things get a little bit clearer about what it is that we're trying to do. I am a trained EMDR therapist. I have applied this methodology to a number of different situations. I'm going to share how some of that's, how some of that has worked and what I think might be uh, worthwhile for us to consider as we uh, try to work with folks that have these comorbidities of domestic violence, substance abuse, and uh, family violence. <clears throat> this uh, PowerPoint will be available online. You all have that incredible technology here in Norway, so uh, I'm not going to go through all of the um, literature, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how people learn these situations. Uh, you know, monkey see, monkey do. Doesn't uh, you know, everyone understands you know, the impact of living a, a particular type of way? We all know from Alice Miller the impact that it takes when somebody is told that they're worthless, that they're good for nothing, and you use physical violence to actually discipline somebody. You begin to feel that in your body, you begin to feel that uh, in your psyche, that there is something inherently wrong with you. Not only do you make mistakes, 
you are a mistake. And that has tremendous implications for who we are, particularly in our attachments. The lesson I think that's most difficult to extinguish when people are chemically dependent and domestically violent is that people who love you hurt you. You learn that association. You know, uh, my mother and father had an incredibly hot relationship. You know what I mean? It was hot, too hot, and they burned themselves up in the process. And so, you know, how many victims of family violence do we know they go from one violent man to another? You know, they find the same excitement, <coughs> they find a nice guy like Per, and they say, man, he's boring. I don't want to be boring. You know, I like guys like Ricardo because he's hot, man. I like, <laughs> and I like hot men. And yet, you know, they get burned up and they wonder why that happens. So in their attachments, they learn to condition themselves to find these kinds of experiences that, you know, fulfill them. Not only do we have uh, physical wounding, psychic wounding, but we have spiritual wounding. And that really, I don't know how to emphasize that more. As I share the work that we've done with the National Combatives Network, we found out 20 years ago when treatment programs invited men, when chemical dependency programs were not able to successfully engage men, when we're starting to arrest men for being domestically violent and waiting months and months for them to get it, that they had a problem and maybe they could do something about it. We found that in prayer, there was something about prayer, something about coming together and sharing the prayer and saying, what's your name, brother? What's your name? And where do you come from? And who do you represent? And what do you want to get out of this place? And what's your carga? What's your baggage? And what's your regalo? What's your gift? That man immediately felt safe. And I don't think it had anything to do with us. I think it had to do with the ancient ceremony of calling the spirit and calling the ancestors of community. So making things safe allows people to attend to that. In the history of working with colonized peoples, in the book Family Violence and Men of Color, one of the validations that really happened for me was not only did we find that for Latino men, mestizo men, immigrant men from Latin America, had they, were they suffering from intergenerational post-traumatic stress disorder and internalized colonialization, but the Maoris in New Zealand as well and the African Americans because of the history of slavery as well. And the Chinese immigrants that came to the United States and many of the Chinese people who lived in China also had experience and still lived in that kind of way. So we all learn our flavor of patriarchy from these historical perspectives. And so to ignore them is to ignore a great piece of somebody's history. And not only do we ignore, were we ignoring people's histories, we're also not validating that they had learned well. And that's really my message. When somebody comes in to uh, work with me, I say, where did you learn how to Well, my father beat my mother. And what else did you learn? Well, you know, everyone in the neighborhood was around. Okay, and, uh, you know, what about your history? Well, I come from San Salvador, you know. San Salvador, where we fought with each other for, you know, uh, 20 years and nobody won. And we sent CIA operatives to help them. And we trained death squad members to do that. And then people begin to understand that the history, the con context of the learning of the violence was something beyond just themselves, something just beyond their family, something just beyond their community. And that, in fact, now that I understood where I learned it, I could make a choice whether I actually wanted to continue to live in that way. And for those men and women, that have been violated in uh, significant ways, I think it's crucial that we rule out the impact of uh, traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I do work with the military, and what we have found out with military families is that there are significant neural, psychological deficits for multiple deployments. You don't necessarily need to see live action to have an impairment in your memory, perception and your uh, psycho neuropsych, uh, neuro neurobiology. So uh, think about it, and when I talk about migration, the same kind of situation for people that migrate. I have had many immigrants that I do psychological evaluations for, or I work with, that are not going to tell me what the 
traumas were that they experienced as they migrated from one country to another. And something crucial for us, if we're going to successfully engage in this, to try to understand who it is that they are. One of the things I want to share with you today and in the workshop is what I've learned about clients, what I've learned about their language, what I've learned about how to address and deal with them in, in a way so that we can establish a secure attachment. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is we look at it from a holistic perspective, that we have a process, we, we have psychological assessments. You have psychodiagnostic processes. You've got psychological tests. You use the Rorschach, I use the Rorschach. Those are all fine, those are all great. They teach us a lot about the individual. But I want to know, can it is, who are you? You know, what is it, what, who are you in a way that allows me to understand the meaning that you have in your life? Uh, I don't know what you call it these days, but you know it's important for me to understand where that person is coming from. So their story of migration, who they are, what they're about, who they represent, what do they actually learn, so that I can understand something about this person that I'm working with. And in understanding that person, then possibly we might be able together to integrate that information so we can develop a call it treatment plan, a working plan, a recovery plan, whatever you want to do, but something that we're working in together. And ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to do something about that. And what I have found in my work is that working individually with people or even doing group work with people is not enough. You have to, we have to, we are finding ways of building communities that are safe. What happened, guys? What happened to the time when you lived in a family, when a woman was being threatened, somebody said that they were going to harm them, and all of you guys used to stand up? It's not going to happen here. It's not happening here. What happened? We came to sophisticated. We believed in the, in the uh, myths about domestic violence as a crime behind closed doors. It's not our business. It's not our problem. Let me invite you to consider that it is. And that the day, when the day comes that we as a community again just stand up, we won't need police officers to intervene. We won't need you know, uh, paramedics coming in to do emergency response. We won't need the military, you know, uh, to, to intervene in hostile situations. That the community will make it happen. And that's what I'm looking forward to trying to make happen. And other countries are willing to do the same thing. So it has to be a social movement. You all know about lethality. I'm not going to do that. I'll leave that uh, here. There's been a lot of, of research on that. I do want to spend a little time on attachment theory. So we know that, that our neurobiology is shaped by the amount of touch that we have. And okay, Singles taught us that. Every grandmother that I know has said that. Right? When I tell my mother, hey, mom, I want to tell you about attachment theory. She says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You touch somebody and they feel better? I know that. I know that. I can tell you that. I'm a better psychologist than you. Now she's gotten kinder, you know, as the years have gone on. She doesn't call me, you know, a bunch of names too much anymore. But nonetheless, you know, she says, I know that. So, you know, when a baby cries, you say, roo, 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 And it sets the capacity for us to have a secure attachment. Now, uh, I don't know too many people with secure attachments. I don't work with people that have a secure attachment. I never had a secure attachment. And uh, Stella will tell you when we do our workshop later that the first thing the guys ask is, uh, hey, uh, Maestra, uh, you got a movie about something like that? Um, what's a secure attachment? What's a good relationship? How do you have that? How do you do that? So people that come in, come in and the way they, uh, and you see, what's explained it is, you know, and, you, and those of you that subscribe to this theoretical orientation, 
understand this. Secure attachment happens when I see you, I understand you, and I will meet your needs. I see you, I understand you, and I'm going to meet your needs. So if our needs aren't met, then we're going to develop some difficulties in the way in which we process certain types of things. So the child is crying, they're hungry, and the caretaker comes over and gives them a blanket. Hey, I'm still hungry, okay? Now I'm hot, so I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> I'm not sure, mommy or daddy know how to take care of me, so okay, I'll take the blanket, but can we get to the milk, please, for trouble? So please, you know, attend to me. So you start to get confused and you start to not be trusting of your caretaker. Uh, how many people do we know that we work with that really want to be good mothers or good fathers? They have severe anxiety about taking care of their child. The child is crying. They, you know, have some needs. They come over and they feed them, or they come over and they give them a blanket, or they do what they think the child needs, and the child just feels the anxiety from the caretaker. So the child begins to think, "What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me every time I'm crying?" or I need something that mommy or daddy is so nervous. There must be something wrong with me. All right. Or the disorganized attachment person, which is kind of like the way I was raised, when the baby cried, threw him against the wall. Or you just walked out on the child. Those are the people I work with. Those disorganized attachments. that set the stage for borderline psychopathology. Okay, and these are the people that are in residential treatment programs. These are the people that are in prisons. Oh, oh, by the way, these are the people that work in law enforcement. These are the people that are in the military. These are the people that, you know, have very high positions of authority in violent situations. And, 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 and in order to be able to do a good job in some of those high-risk situations, you have to, in some ways, become detached. So an impairment in, in, in that attachment makes some sense. So the point that I need to make here is not only do we have an impairment in neurobiology when we are raised in violent, chaotic situations. I'm not going to go over what the maestro said, the elder. Uh, he explained it quite well. All we know is that there's an imbalance and a disturbance of the neurobiology. But there's also a disturbance in the psychology of people and in the impairment of their um, of their psychological processes. So not only do we have neurobiology impairment, but the rest of the issues in terms of our psychology. Perception, cognitions, how we see uh, situations, what our, the makeup of our personality and what are our unconscious processes. How do all of these funnel through when people have these type of symptoms? And I think this is where we do the best job of doing assessments or, or clarifying for people. Uh, we're, how do they manage avoiding the traumatic experience? Are they having nightmares or are they disassociated? You know, how, and how were they before the trauma? And if you have multiple traumas, it's important to find out what was pre-morbid functioning beforehand. You know, if uh, somebody has been traumatized and used to track things you know, well, had a language to explain things, could tell a story but no longer can. There's some pre morbid functioning that uh, isn't present anymore. The same thing with how they handle it. Most of us uh, that were raised in chaotic, domestically violent homes, crime filled in, in uh, neighborhoods like I were raised, uh, found ways of coping. You use, you know, certain kind of chemicals and substances to try to deal with that or multiple relationships because that helps us avoid the situation. Uh, hyper arousal, uh, we begin to identify with the impairment that we have uh, in that particular situation and we certainly have significant impairments in how we relate to other people. So what's important here, I think, is for us to be able to establish the security in our attachments from the very beginning so we can help them deal with these particular situations. My, I call the therapeutic endeavor with people 
Palabra therapy. Palabra therapy means word. And it's a little bit more than uh, clinical uh, affiliation or uh, uh, interpersonal bonding. Palabra means something completely different. Go back to attachment. I see you, I understand you, and I will meet your needs. I will attend to them. Within limits, of course. We're talking about professional relationship. We're not talking about you know, anything else. But in the context of working with somebody professionally, are you going to be available for me when I'm in my point of crisis and I need to connect with somebody to help me deal with this particular situation? Let me give you an example. I learned this back in the 80s. I did my doctoral dissertation uh, uh, on men who battled. The guy I worked with was Michael Lindsay, who ran the uh, Abusive Men Exploring New Directions program in Denver, Colorado. He was a staunch cognitive behaviorist. Attachment theory wasn't popular, you know, barely analyzing Bowlby's research, you know, back in the uh, 80s, you know, really hadn't come to fruition. But this guy, this guy was always on the phone. We get ready to do workshops or to do presentations. And those were the days before we had cell phones, so we had a beeper. Now, beeper was always going off. I said, no, what are you doing, man? We're getting ready to do this presentation. We're in Norway. We've got to get ready. Come on, Michael, let's go. And Michael was always on the phone. He says, look, man, this is the deal. I would rather have them call me and be connected to me and be relating to me rather than him obsessing them how he's going to hurt her, how he's going to harm her. So he understood attachment way, way, way before it was popular, way, way before uh, we, uh, we had any sense of it. And in terms of addressing this from an attachment theory, if you listen to Daniel Sonkin, you understand his interpretation of lethality. That once the uh, offender begins to feel, once the person who is domestically violent begins to feel that their object is beginning to separate, is beginning to move away, then the perception of how they see that attachment raises severe anxiety. It's explained, you know, from the Duluth model as power and control. He needs to have more control, so he's going to, you know, exercise that power and control. Daniel has a different perspective. He says it's the raising of the anxiety that really causes this person to cross the line. If I can't have, I can't live without you. So if I've already crossed the line from life and death, I can't live without you. Then it's very easy to say, if I can't live without you, then nobody else can live with you. Can, can, can live with you. Then nobody else is going to have you. And then it's very easy to cross the line even further to say, if I can't have you, and nobody else can have you, then I'm just going to kill everybody in your circle if you don't come back. You know? So the anxiety is what forces this person. So really looking at people that have severe impairment in their function in their interpersonal relationships. And I think that's why it sets the stage for us to look at things and help them understand what it is we're trying to help them to do. And what we're trying to help them to do is learn something that really was very ancient for us in the Americas. And that is that relationships were sacred. There was a sacredness in relations. And so people have a distorted worldview now of how they should relate. Men who domestically uh, abuse women have this perception in the United States that women are their property, that she's an object, that she's there to serve him. And he's going to exercise all of his power to be able to keep her under control. And, and every culture has their own particular viewpoint of that. We have ours. In Spanish, it goes like this. Uh, a la mujer, ni todo el dinero, ni todo el amor. To the woman, she should, you should not give her all of your money, nor all of your love. Okay. La mujer como la carabina cargada y en la esquina. The woman should be like a carbine, loaded and in the corner. <laughs> That's our version of barefoot and pregnant. Right? There are many songs that contribute to this belief in thinking. Tú, solo tú, eres causa de todo mi llanto, de mi desencanto y desesperación. 
Now, you want to translate for that? <laughs> You're the cause of all my pain and all my suffering and all my desperation. And my mother says, oh, that's a beautiful song. I said, that's a terrible song. <laughs> but my daddy used to play all these songs for her. Usted es la culpable de todas mis angustias. You know, you are the cause of all my anguish. That's love. Well, in these relationships, they were. And in the 40s and the 50s, when those songs came out, they were very romantic. You know, but people misinterpret it, and they're used today, they're used today, to keep a woman in her place. Not only do men do that, but women do that. Right? You heard those saying, oh, you know, you got your bed, made your bed, lying. You're married to him, you gotta do what he's gotta do, you know. Uh, I don't know. So this is this is an ongoing story. Culturally, if we don't address those situations, don't deal with those situations, we're not going to be able to change the way that they are. And so it's important for us in our recovery to take that those issues into consideration. Um, I just want to share with you a particular perspective about how we see the National Compadres Network and the National Latino Alliance for the Elimination of Domestic Violence. Uh, I was a founding member of that group. And we believe that there are old ways in which we uh, relate to each other that really have some connection for us in Latin America. When you were well educated in uh, pre-Columbian times, you were said to have cara y corazón. And when you spoke, you spoke with such grace and such beauty that it was called flor y canto, flower and, uh, and poetry. And so cara y corazón represented the beauty of being well-educated. So if somebody was well-educated, they were respectful. You, know? uh, you come in the house and uh, you, know, you say, yeah, saluda, say hello. Oh, I don't want to go over and talk to my uncle. Over, say hello, you know, I don't want to. He stinks. He drinks too much. I don't want to go over there. Get over there and say hello to your uncle right now. Okay. I do. Okay. <laughs> so the teachings doesn't matter who they are. You have to be respectful. You have to acknowledge your elders. You have to acknowledge everything that's living. That's what dignity was about. So in the old pre-Columbian times, severe punishment was meant to doubt the children that were disrespectful of any living thing, two-legged, four-legged, winged, or element. If you threw away water, it's wasteful. If you burned something without having purpose, it was wasteful. You know, if you didn't respect the wind. And in fact, mental health, mental health in Mexico and in many parts of indigenous America is not looked upon the way we see it in terms of psychopathology and diagnosis. <laughs> Curanderos and healers look at somebody and they say, they want to understand, que viento tienes? What wind do you have that's inside? Resentimiento, tristeza, resentment, sadness, fear, anxiety, depression, Espanto, being frightened, miedo, having fear, or susto, being traumatized. And every one of those vientos has a particular treatment. It's called la limpia. You clean out the air that is preventing you from being present <coughs> physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Very simple way of looking at the world, but the people that we work with kind of struggle and suffer through this. Uh, okay, let me uh, share with you a little healing process. We're, we're not going to do the movie, so let's not worry about it. Um, when my children were small, Renaldo and Regina, they were uh, five, six years old, um, my job was to fix them, fix them breakfast. So I fix them breakfast and uh, I take them to school. And they were both very beautiful and vivacious and, and, and very involved children. They could speak about everything, especially Ronaldo. So one day I'm taking Ronaldo to school 
basses, and we had the music playing, and something was playing. He said, well, that's kind of a sad song, huh, Dad? He said, yeah, it could be a sad song. He says, you know, that reminds me of uh, Mary. I said, Mary? Who's Mary? He says, that's my girlfriend. I said, you have a girlfriend? How old are you? Five. You have a girlfriend? You're five? Okay. And we're going to get married. I said, who okay. cares? Five years old, he's going to get married. I said, okay, all right. But you know what surprised me about that interaction, and I knew it in that moment, there was something very special about talking to my son that I had never had with my father. I never once shared anything with my father about what was happening with me, but what I was, what was going on in my life. And my son, freely, openly, you know how Daniel Siegel uh, talks about regulation of that fact? You know, my grandson shows it to me all the time. Uh, you want to go to the park before? Yeah, Grandpa, let's go. Why do those? Yeah. <laughs> and we get to the park, and the slide doesn't work. Oh, man, Grandpa. What's the matter, Rico? Well, the slide doesn't work, and there's no swings. So, well, you know, let's, uh, let's play uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Jack Sparrow, come on, shiver me timbers. Okay, Grandpa, and we're playing with sticks, and it's great. You know how kids are you stop playing, right? And all of a sudden, you meet it, and they go... <laughs> Time to go, okay, Grandpa. <laughs> hey, you know what, Grandpa? What do you I had a good time with you. Yeah? That's regulation of that thing. Well, now it was like that, too, when he was small. And then, you know, I'm in the middle of uh, trying to get my life together and got too much on my plate and still PTSD and clean and sober and white-knuckling it. And uh, I went... Back in the truth. I relapsed for the last time, you know, 16 years ago. And um, my son, you know, and my daughter were living with their mother in the Central Valley. And uh, my son came to live with me when he was 14. He looked a lot like Pyramid. Bald-headed, tough, mean. <laughs> <laughs> pissed off. But he was pissed off more than anything else because I wasn't around. So we, uh, we were having a hard time. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just like you are. I'm a psychologist. So I tested my children. My son is a standard deviation above the mean. He drew in, you know, three dimensions to two. Right? right kid. He's failing every class. Goes to school, maybe. He's failing all his classes. He's playing football, but you know, he's playing American football, and he wants to hurt people. And one day, I uh, I uh, saw he was having a hard time. He wanted to go do something. I said, uh, "What are you doing?" He says, uh, "You know, I want to go do this thing." I said, "No, you, you can't go. You are uh, you are uh, not doing, going to school. You're not holding up your end of the contract." And he said. Uh, all right, starts tearing up the things in the house, starts breaking things up in the house. And I said, okay, do whatever you want to do, just break it up outside. And then I looked at him and I thought about it and I said, uh, what'd you do with my son? What did you do with that little boy who used to be able to talk to me? What happened to him? And he looked at me and he said, he left when you did. I said, yeah. Okay. That's fair. But you know what? Excuse my language, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm here. I'm alive. And I'm clean. And I'm sober. And if you want a relationship with me, I would like to have one with you. Because you know what? I didn't get that shot. I didn't get that chance. My daddy died when I was nine. 
and for the rest of my life, up until 20 years ago, I kept looking for daddy. I kept looking for my father. So I looked at my son and I said, well, what are we going to do? Now, I'm attachment impaired, right? <laughs> I got a dismissive attachment style. I'm PTSD. I'm using narcotics to try to numb myself. I disassociate from time to time. I got a hyper-aroused central nervous system. I got too much serotonin, not enough serotonin. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? And that's when I'm sober. You know, and I'm trying to raise a son. So I went to my circle. I went to my group of men, and I said, help me. Help me raise this boy. Because I don't know how to do it. And in community, in community, the men would reach out, and they would say, Nago, your dad loves you. Ah, oh, that son of a Ronaldo, your dad loves you. Oh, Ronaldo, Ronaldo is the one in the middle. And on the left hand side is the youngest grandson, Micah. And this is my oldest grandson, David. Ronaldo is on the USS Higgins in the Navy. Ronaldo is the special communications tech. So do you think he'd email me? Do you think he'd call me? Do you think he'd use radar and say, Dad, I'm okay? And then once in a while, he might you know, get some. But anyway, he's clean and sober. He's not drug dependent. He's not domestically violent. He's a good uncle. Someday he's going to be a good husband. And those two grandbabies, they don't ever, ever have to live what I live. They like themselves. The little one, he's fearless. He's two. His brother's playing soccer. He wants to play soccer. You know, the waves. He goes out to the ocean. He don't care. He's going to go out there as far as he can go. He's fearless. He doesn't have any fear. He doesn't believe he's worthless. He knows he is worthy because his mom, my daughter, said to herself, watching the impairment in my attachment with her mother, that's not going to happen. So she married her high school boyfriend, who's active duty National Guard in Afghanistan. So if somebody as tore up as me can get through the process with enough support, I think if we can take what we understand about science, and if we can understand the art of healing, then we can apply it, then we can help communities of people get there. So I want to close by offering a song to you. This is my mother's song. Because my dad used to sing such terrible songs for her. I figured we needed to learn how to do some different kinds of songs. Yeah. 
that someone is giving me flowers. <laughs> and I want to uh, thank you for being part of your community that's finding and wanting to make our world safer, to make our world uh, more loving and more caring. And thank you for inviting your compañera Stella and I uh, to your beautiful country. And this is. Uh, put some stuff together. Let me just share with you how it's going to work. I'm going to take uh, the first part of the workshop about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so uh, you see the curriculum here. I want to entertain uh, questions that you have. What do you want to know specifically about the model uh, that you might be curious about? For a real, a well-defined definition of the model, it's in family violence and men of color. I encourage you to get it because there's other contributors that have great stuff in there. And then the second half of the workshop will be Stella's, uh, my compañera. We say in Spanish, partner, compañera. Uh, not my wife, not my, uh, you know, second, uh, uh, you know, my partner. And she is a partner, you know, in life. And uh, we have grandchildren together. And, uh, and we share this work. She was one of the first people that, uh, when we were training people in this model, she came to, she said, I, I like it. I, I think I can use it with the men. I think I, I can, uh, you know, uh, do something with this. I think this makes some sense. And she then has developed her own idea of what uh, works for her in terms of applying these concepts into men and to helping them develop their healthy relationships. So I'll let her explain that when we get to that point. But I covered a lot of territory, uh, and the problem with my presentation is sometimes people get confused with my personal story and the work. I don't fall apart in front of my clients, okay? Let's get that straight, okay? <laughs> I'm not hugging and kissing everybody all the time, you know? Uh, if I get it, great, but I need permiso. I need permission, okay? So, so, so the, the work, my work and the work are separate, although they're intermingled. Although, you know, the reason that I think I'm effective is because I've been there. I've walked through the fire, I understand what recovery is, I understand what healing is, and I'm in process. I'm still, you know, working through things. I still have, you know, road rage. I still, you know, sometimes want to kill somebody. I still uh, don't listen too well. I still get caught up in, in my stuff. and. Uh, and what helps me is the community that I involve myself in. And you know, from time to time, I have to do an EMDR session, you know, work through some stuff that's come up, another trauma that's come through. So I surround myself by people that are gonna be helpful to me. So if I wanna share anything with you, it's how do we take care of ourselves in this work? Yes? We're going to get a mic because the people behind, they're not uh, getting a hold of what you say. Oh, okay. So if you could uh, try to... Me? Yes. Adam Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Okay, it's better. Yeah, speak into the microphone. Carrillo. Okay, all right. Okay, so anyway, uh, entertain. Thoughts, questions, what do you want me to concentrate on for this workshop? Because our time will go like this. Okay, get inside that. What do you want to know? Yes, sir. Say that again. Okay, so that's okay, very good, very good point. How do we develop and sustain a community? Okay, yes, sir. Who are these men and how many? Who are these men and how many? Okay, all right. Any, uh, anybody else? Yes. But I was very interested in the title, Healing the Wounded Spirit. How, how do you conceptualize the healing? Okay. And, yeah. All right, how do we conceptualize the healing? Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, could you talk about spiritual issue? About what? The spiritual issue. Spiritual issue. Okay. Because the issue is not the particular uh, spiritual thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's let's uh, let's set the stage. Let's set the stage for how this actually works out. Okay. First and foremost, let me just tell you, share with you the story of how this happened. Uh, we're working on a documentary uh, that we will very soon have finished, I hope, that interviews the men that started this process 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I did my, I did my doctoral dissertation in 1983, and I was doing standardized batter's intervention work. And uh, then somebody said, hey, man, you got to meet this guy, Jerry Dayo. He's just like you. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> 
he's like you, he does this kind of work, and he's a musician, and the two of you guys, you know, seem like you have a lot of common. So Jerry and I got together and we started, uh, you know, to, besides heckling each other presentations and making fun of each other, really got to, you know, develop a pretty good relationship and mutual respect for each other. He was doing child abuse prevention work and I was doing batterers intervention work. And we decided, Jerry wanted to do a, a workshop um, uh, on fatherhood. And he said, you, would you do this workshop with me? And I looked at him, I had two small children, and I said, Jerry, what do you and I know about fatherhood? My father died when I was nine. Your father was drunk. He died when he was when we were 12. What do we know about father? So he says, oh, come on, man, let's, let's do this. So we had both already been studying in California in the last 50 years. Uh, there have been maestros, teachers that have come up from Mexico to teach us the old ways in danza, azteca, in, uh, in colloquia, in what we call the calmeca, or, you know, uh, schools of of thought so we could understand these philosophies. And there were two centers that were working on applying these principles to mental health practices. So I studied with the San Francisco group and Jerry was instrumental in the Los Angeles group. So we applied these principles. We applied uh, the, the, the four directions. We applied the notion of, uh, of having a prayer circle. We talked about having an altar. And the altar was, was crucial because we wanted to have something very concrete that people could relate to. The reason I thought this was a good idea, I was working with batterers groups from Nicaragüenses who were Somosistas and Sandinistas in the same group. I had death squad members and victims of the Civil War from San Salvador in the same group. I had Cubano Marialito that had come over from the boat that Fidel had kicked out of Cuba, you know, and Mexicans and uh, Dominicanos in San Francisco. So it was a really wide range of, of Latinos from various communities. But several things that resonated for them that allowed them to work with us, work with me, was the language. We were language specific and everyone believed in some level of spirituality. They might be Christian, they might be Catholic, you know, some of these people were indigenous folks. So the idea we could use something that was culturally relevant made sense and we began the use of the altar. The altar is really a very important process, I think, because these are men who are out of control. These are men who, as they say, are men without breaks. That's what they've said. I'm not crazy, doc. I don't, you know, I, I don't have a mental illness. I don't have, you know, uh, that kind of problem. I am a man without breaks. In Spanish is, yo soy un hombre desenfrenado. So kind of started paying attention to that. These are men without breaks. And then the literature started indicating there was a high correlation between reckless driving and domestic violence. So confirming you know, their own belief about themselves. So, uh, so part of the language was that when I started doing the work around colonialization, and, uh, and I don't have a, it would be ludicrous to play something in Spanish that, that you don't understand. But let me just tell you what the, what, what the process is. Uh, psycho, process psychotherapy is not really appropriate for uh, not very well educated migrant folks because that's not the kind of psychology that they resonate to, nor do they understand. How do you feel? What's that? <laughs> How do I feel? Me siento gacho, man, que estoy aquí, I gotta pay you. I gotta pay you to go to therapy, I don't like that. That's how I feel, I feel angry, you know, okay? So they're angry and upset, but they don't, can't process feelings. So what we needed to do was to help them understand how the process could be helpful to them. So my palabra is I'm gonna help you with your legal situation, I'm gonna help you with your children, I'm gonna help you, I can't help you, you know, uh, uh, reunify possibly with your wife, but I can help some of your legal situations so we could get started that way. And they're coming then to group clarify what it was that they were going to work on. But you got to get them ready. So part of what resonated with people historically is, um, is this notion of colonialization, patriarchy, and, and coming from a system, of, a feudal system, just like you've had it here in Europe. So we play a song. There's, you heard me play some of the songs, those ugly songs that my father used to play for my mother, that my mother thinks are romantic. 
Well, those kind of songs for my generation make sense. The younger groups, now they like listening to that reggaeton. Mira que viene ahí el dominicano mamano. Oye, yo quiero una niña. You know, it gets nasty. Anyway, they're listening to the music and they, they, they listen to the music and they say, oh yeah. Oh yeah, and they start getting the what I call the cock walk. <laughs> See, that's good. Yeah, I like that. And so they get all puffed up, you know, which is really what happens in the cantina, in the in the bar, right? In Mexico, we have tres culturas, three cultures. We have la precolombiana, the pre-Columbian. We have la colonial, the colonial, and we have la cultura de la cantina, okay? <laughs> which is where men find solace and sucker and. You know, oh, my, you know, women don't understand me, my boss hates me, and that type of thing. So they understand that, and so we play these songs, and it feels like they're in the cantina. It feels like they're in the bar. <laughs> After we finish playing the song, I say, well, if your wife wants to work, do, do you let her, or does it not matter to you? Oh, doctor, yes, I let her. I let her go to work, but she has to bring me home the money. I said, oh yeah, that's interesting. Uh, no, I'm not going to let her go to work. She stays home and raises the children. That's my wife, you know, she has to take care of the children. Okay, it's interesting. So we kind of listen to everybody share their point of view and their perception. They say, well, that's interesting. Isn't that what the hacendado does to the peon? Isn't that what the plantation owner does with his slaves? And something happens in the body of Latino immigrants, especially if they work the land, especially if they're in campesinos, especially if they're in poverty stricken, or especially if they had power in Latin America. If you were a somocista and a colonel, or you were a cubano, you know, with property in Cuba, and now you just live the life of an immigrant, it's a drastic change to be a dishwasher to be a campesino, to work the land, to be a gardener, to be a garbage collector. Right? You feel the difference, and that's part of the experience for people. So they look at me and I say, that, well, you know, where does uh, you let them, you know? And they, and they say, yes, you know, the Hacendado way. I say, well, where does that come from? And they say, well, doctor, that comes from el machismo. Now, this is an interesting concept because every culture and every society, maybe you've more advanced than we are. Maybe Norwegians have found a way to have egalitarian relationships. But in most of the rest of the world that has high rates of domestic violence, patriarchy certainly contributes to that. So I want to know where you learned this. So the guys say, well, I learned that from this concept. Well, define that concept. What does it mean to be un hombre macho? Well, that means I can you know, have any woman I want. I don't have to be good looking. In fact, I'm short and fat and ugly, but I have all these women, right? According to them. I can drink as much as I want. I can I have I dictate and, and make all make all the decisions about how we're gonna spend the money. And in the distorted view of machismo, I am loyal to my friends. So there's one list over here of in macho, right? On the other side, we list different uh, things that we understand about machismo, which is a man who's a macho is a man of his word, tiene palabra. El macho is a protector, he protects his family. El macho is loyal and faithful to his wife. A macho looks out for his children and his elders. Now we have two separate lists up on the board. And I say, so where are you guys? Oh, doctorcito, you know I'm in between the two. <laughs> they want to make fun. See, they want to make fun of this thing. To, to them, it's, it's a fun thing. I'm colluding with them because I want a decision. Are you over here or are you over here? Because if you're over here, there's the door and don't let it hit you on the way out. <laughs> but if you want to learn how to be un hombre noble, you want to learn how to be un hombre de palabra, you want to learn how to be affectionate, and this is where Stella's work is very important, because they don't know. <clears throat> They're attachment impaired. They're traumatized. They're drinking alcohol, snorting cocaine, taking methamphetamine, 
having sex with transgenders because they can't score with a woman in San Francisco. You see what I'm saying? High risk for HIV. They put themselves at risk. They don't know how to have a healthy relationship. They don't know what that looks like. Somebody in their childhood told them something about that, but they don't know what that is. So if they decide they want to work on this, then we've got something to work on. We have now a behavioral contract. I can help you with that. How do we set the community up? How we set the community up is these guys come into treatment and they're forced by the courts, but we have a men's circulo outside of the community that when they complete their treatment, drug and alcohol or domestic violence, they can come to the circulo. We have circulos in San, in San Diego, California, San Antonio, Texas, and Los Angeles, where we've been doing this work for 20 years. So we have a community of elders, middle-aged men, youth, young men, teens. Each group is mentoring the younger group. We have a program called Joven Noble, which is concentrating on the rite of passage program for young men, moving from being a boy into becoming a man, a man of your word, a man who's protective, or that type of thing. So we have now communities of people that have been mentored by elder uh, youth and have concentrated on living this way. This is not a program. Let me just clarify. This is not a program. This is not something you get a certificate for. This is a way of life. So if you're part of the Jove Noble project, or you're part of El Hombre Noble, don't be messing around with other women in the community. Don't drink in public. Don't get arrested because the group will hold you accountable for that. Because you're, a re we have a saying in La Cote, in, uh, in, La, in, uh, in now what? En La Quiche, tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. You're a reflection of me. I'm your mirror, you're my mirror. Now if you're not acting according to these principles, that's a bad reflection on me. Women, women want to know where the good guys are. Hey, Ricardo, where are the good guys? So when we get done with the retreat, we do annual retreats, about six a year. We've been doing it for 20 years. They put on bands, and the band is reflective of the wisdom of the old times, the black and the red, it was the color of the ink. And then the brown is intertwined in there, reflecting the color of their mestizo skin. That band is put on for them to understand that they're part of a community. They belong to a community. And this community is going to hold them accountable, but also be supportive for them. Number two, that band is placed on your right hand, so you never raise your hand to hit a woman or a child. And we expect that kind of behavior from the men in the group. Now, some guys, you know, fall off. Some guys slip. Some guys have problems. And the group is there to help support them. Three months ago, to give you an example of how we build community, three months ago, one of our members of my circle in San Francisco, Marla Mayorga, is a, uh, was a 40-year-old young man who was doing quite well for himself. He was an ex-gang banger that had gotten out of the gangs. He had been a, a PCP user for a number of years. He was sober now, 16 years. He was a salsa dancer, you know what I mean? And the girls would line up to dance with him. Line up, because he was so good. Well, he got married. Finally, found a woman that he wanted to settle down with, a Puerto Rican gal, really nice gal. He had a child, a three-year-old child. Marlon was walking his dog. There was a botched robbery down the street. These guys, young guys, young, young guys, tried to rip somebody else off. He got away. They saw Marlon. They said, hey, man, give me your money. He said, man, I ain't got no money. I'm walking my dog. I don't even have my cell phone. Bam! Shot him with a 22. Dead. Didn't even make it to the emergency room. So when Marlon died, um, it affected the community. So the community quickly, the men's circulo, quickly went to Sandra, his wife, and said, what do you need? Food, clothing. I can't handle anything, she says. Well, we'll handle the funeral arrangements. We'll handle the media. We'll handle the relationship with the police department. 
his family came out from Miami. They're Nicaraguenses Nikita, from uh, parents who lived in Miami. They came out. They needed support. And then the family got a chance to learn what Marlon was involved in and what the Circulo was about. The Danzantes, the Aztec dancers, came from a number of different communities to celebrate his life, but to also pray for him and dance. And his parents, who were Nicaragüense, had never seen this before, said, what is this? So we explained the ceremony to them. And they were honored that their son was being honored in that way. Now, Sandra is not alone. And those of us that understand the fatherhood business spend time with his daughter, Sandra's daughter, Marlon's daughter. And uh, we do what we can without violating the boundaries, being respectful, being present. She needs something fixed. The community is going to be responsive to her. And in the group, we uh, really look at trying to find ways of being supportive to each other. What's impressive is in this community, in San Antonio and in San Diego, is you see young teen boys mentoring uh, five, six, seven, eight-year-old boys so that they have some father figure, older male figure, walking them through, teaching them ceremonial ways. Remember, this is indigenous, Chicano, Latino kind of work, and our indigenousness really helps clarify for us who we are. So we're learning from uh, maestros about these ways and how they were applied and how we can apply them today. Uh, as that community grows, you really become impressed to see a college graduate who is a ceremonial figure who's got a master's degree in computer science uh, or, a, or, or a marine biologist still coming into the neighborhood saying, hey, how you doing? What do you need? How do I help out? So these become our, you know, it's really incredible. We have a group in, uh, at the, that right out of the university of California in Santa Barbara, 15 guys, always in the school, always coming through and graduating and still sticking around. Of course, Santa Barbara's a nice place to live, right? <laughs> so you know, that's, a, that's another reason. So that's how we've managed to do it. Now our challenge is, I'm getting old, Jerry's getting old, how do we keep the young blood moving through? How do we inspire them? You know, your children all don't always follow your legacy. <laughs> What you believe in may not be important to them, so you have to find ways you know, to kind of make that happen. And so the stories of the men and the men coming through, the healing, the healing really happens with uh, people coming and bringing and sharing. The, my son's story uh, was one of the first father and son working through of things. The, the very first one uh, that came to share was a uh, sergeant in the, in the Marine Corps, a paratrooper in the Marine Corps, his son was a sheriff's, um, a sheriff's officer, and he, his grandson, came to the retreat for the first time probably 15 years ago. And when he came, he said, you know, my father raised us. He put a you know, roof over our head. Uh, but he never told me he loved me. And so Sarge, his dad, listened to his son and uh, watched his grandson. And he said, oh, OK, well, let me tell you how it was, son. Right? Let me tell you how it was. When I was growing up, after the Mexican Revolution, and my father fought in the Revolution, I decided I was going to protect my country, so I joined the Marine Corps. And I went to fight in Vietnam, and there wasn't a day when I was over in Vietnam that I didn't think of my children, and I didn't think of my wife. And you know what? My father never told me he loved me. But in front of God and all these men, I want to say that I love my son. Now Sarge, about six feet, big guy, still has a buzz cut, you know, not very affectionate at all, real, you know, man's man, says, I love my son. And his grandson is watching this happen. We're watching it happen. And we're saying, wow, if these guys can do it, we can do it too. So Gil, his son, he doesn't come anymore. But Sarge comes every year. 
And last year he came and he said, I've got cancer again for the second time. I don't know how much longer I have, but as long as I can make it, I'm going to be here. We don't get paid. We don't make money. We don't get cash. This is something, this is God's work. This is our work. We just keep, as we say in traditional way, the fireplace going. We keep the fireplace going, and men are welcome to come. And that's really the thing, especially, I think, I think for everybody, but especially for immigrant men who have been displaced, who have left their country of origin, left their families, <laughs> left their places that are familiar to them. They feel displaced, and I think that contributes to that. I wish my father would have had a place where he could go to. He didn't. But we now have places in 20 places in the United States. Mexico's interested, but we're too touchy-feely for them. The Mexicans like staying in their head. So let me, uh, I hope I've answered uh, some of your questions. Let me turn it over to Stella. Stella's going to share with you how she's managed to apply this work uh, with the men that she works with. Uh, what Ricardo was talking about is the voluntary part of men's work. What I do is the court mandated. In 1996, the laws changed after the the Simpson, Nicole Simpson, O.J. Simpson situation. And it, it was, um, before I started, it was 14 weeks of treatment. 14, the judge, it was up to the judge. Um, the guy would get arrested and he would say, you get 14, you get 20, you get 16, blah, blah, blah. Well, after 1996, a new law passed, and it was 52 weeks mandatory for anyone, man or woman, arrested for domestic violence. Um, I was going to grad school at the time. I was a starving student. I didn't know what to do part-time while I went to school. I had a friend in the, in the it's called Family Services, that um, I knew. He knew me as a social worker. And I says, you know, I can do some work. And I go, um, how about some of the, the batter's treatment? And he says, well, he goes, we don't got that many women, but if you want to start working with the men, that's fine. It was kind of scary at first, being a woman, to work with men. But I gave it a shot. I loved it. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be as easy. Um, and, and not only that, the big change of going from 14 weeks to 52 weeks you could only imagine the men. My God, a year with you, the nagging, the, oh, we gotta pay you, what do you do with all that money, and you know. So it was really, I was trained in the Duluth model, the Duluth model of power and control. And I don't know how many are familiar with the Duluth model. Pretty much everybody, it's the honeymoon, the tension, the violence, and the remorse. Well, I taught that for, I, I was trained by two men, and um, they were very controlled. They were, you know, you don't have a relationship, you know, they just got to be responsible, they got to take responsibility. Your job is just to make sure they do that. Well, you know, that didn't sit well with me. I was like lost. I didn't know, I didn't fit well in that model. And, um, and I said, you know, we're always teaching them what a dysfunctional pattern is, you know. You know, it seems like some of them knew what their pattern was with violence, but what about teaching them some healthy ways? Mm -hmm. And um, do you have that up there? So um, when I started teaching the, the cycle of violence, I mean, it, they, they know what their violence is. Of course, there's denial. But when I saw this, um, Ricardo's model of healthy relationships, I said, you know, why not teach them how healthy relationships are supposed to look like instead of teaching them what they already know. Well, the men immediately, uh, actually they were asking me, what, is that? what do you mean healthy relationship? What is that? One of them wanted to see a movie. What does it look like? And I did have a movie, I have a couple of movies actually, that are a fairly decent on, on showing a good relationship. But um, they really had a lot, a lot of just, I don't know what that is. What do you mean? What do you mean uh, acknowledgement? Mm -hmm. And this is a model that I incorporated into, the, into their program. We have, we have certain themes that we have to stick to, and healthy relationships has to, 
you know, happens to be one of them. So the, the conocimiento is the acknowledgement. But the, the work for them is who are they? Um, what do they, you know, what do they like? What do they dislike? Um, ask them, who are they? How many can, you know, get up and say who you are? It's not an easy thing to do. It's a process. So um, they started working with it and really just answering it for themselves was so difficult. So after they do it for themselves is now you go home and you find out who is your partner? Who is she? What does she like? What does she dislike? What does she want in this relationship? What do you want in this relationship? Wow. It was like, we're supposed to know all that? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to have a healthy relationship. It's easy to have a dysfunctional relationship because you don't care. You, um, you go all over the place. You don't have boundaries. That's why you're here. And so, you know, you get tired of, of, of bringing up the bad stuff. So once they find out who they are, you go into the understanding. What do, you know, the understanding of the person in that relationship. Why are they the way they are? What is their baggage? Why does she act like this? Why does she, why does she um, react like this to man? And a lot of times this has to do with their own baggage that they carry. What is your baggage? You know, what is your baggage? What is your relationship to your mother that you can't get along with your partner? So that really starts to resonate with them as to where they started, where they're going to so the next one is the integration. And the integration is after the violence, what happens now? I've hurt you. You know, the boundaries are all over the place. The relationship is unhealthy. How are we going to start to work together in this relationship to make it work? And the next thing was the movement. When you, when you go through these stages, it's really a lot of learning about themselves and really taking the time to learn about their partner, and that's where the movement goes. Can we move? And, um, and the movement is actually setting goals for each other. What are our goals? Are we going to stay in this relationship? What is the damage? And from there, I'll usually go into um, the wounding their, their hurt part. And a lot of them, I, I mean, it sounds kind of crass, but I said the wounded animal. What does a wounded animal look like? A wounded animal doesn't want anybody to touch them. A wounded animal is scared. And they can relate to some of that stuff. Um, and some of them can't, where they really kind of get where are you going with all of this? And it's kind of scary. But it's really a, just a learning about who you are. What do you bring to this relationship? And where are you going? And I found that this, and, and explaining the healthy model to them, is really more learning and, and finding out, can I do this? Because I don't know any man that goes into a relationship and say, I want to marry her so I can knock the crap out of her. I want to marry her so that I can mistreat her. I, and I've never met a man that says, I want to be in a relationship because I want to abuse her. I've never met a man, I've never met a man that's happy about the damage that he's done to his children and his family. So that for them is really wanting them, they're really wanting to learn, I didn't want to do this. I'm, I'm not happy that I'm here and there's a lot of denial. And then, you know, you're breaking through that denial, who's your teacher? Someone who you possibly, a woman who you have the violence with. As a woman, um, being on this side, I do get a lot from them. You, what do you know? You're a woman. And I, I, I don't pretend to know, but you know what I'm going to do with them is I am going to build a relationship with them. And if they can have one healthy relationship with one woman, that being me, that could possibly lead to better relationships because most of them have not had a healthy relationship even with one woman. Our program, there we are, most of the times we have about 300 men enrolled. Actually now I was just telling, Maria? Yeah, I, was just, I was just telling her now I, we've seen an increase in women. We've had, when I started 12 years ago, we had one group of women, now we have two and three groups of women batterers. And we, we, we separate them 
and we do the same work with on the healthy relationships because knowing their cycle of violence is important but I think we were taking it for granted a long, a long time that they knew what a healthy relationship looked like and they don't. So it's been a lot of work in, um, in teaching it. Um, we have five themes. We have the, the gender roles, healthy relationships, self-care, um, and what's the other one, the fifth? Well, we, said we have five themes. Hmm? I think parenting. So we have to um, incorporate, and this one of course is um, healthy relations. Another big area that I work with men on is self-care. You will not believe how hard it is for them to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I've, I've made it a part of just even checking in um, their self-care. How did you take care of yourself this week? Mm -hmm. You know, they come to my groups um, just from work. They're from head to toe filthy dirty. What did you do to take care of yourself? Did you take a bubble bath? Did you read? Did you take five minutes off for yourself? It's really, really hard for them to take care of themselves. And even though I put that in their check-in every week of how they took care of, how they take care of themselves, they don't do it. And it's a constant reminder of what are you going to do to take care of yourself. Um, our program recently and. Um, the United States, I, I don't know, since all of the problems we've had in the United States, I don't know where it's going. I think that healthy relationships is probably the biggest change that I've seen in the last 10 years and add more women in the program. Um, any questions? Anybody else? Let me just uh, share with you these concepts that I think really uh, kind of help uh, things along working with men and their relationships. One of the things that uh, they, uh, the Luth model spent a lot of time on is the notion of power and control. We spend a lot of time on teaching men about their fire. Those of you that remember Robert Bly, you remember Robert Bly? Yeah. Yeah, the men's movement and all that good kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, you know, he talked about the, 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 the fire and the fire in the belly. Men needed to have some ferocity, you know, about manhood. And Michael B., who does storytelling, does a lot of uh, warrior uh, uh, storytelling. And so our storytelling really has to do with where where they are in terms of their uh, different levels of relating to the fire. Because it's really an old warrior concept. What kind of relationship we have to the fire? Most men that are domestically violent are, have too much fire. They're burning up. They're burning themselves up and they're burning up their partner and they're burning everybody else around them. The intent of the work is to teach men as part of their responsibility to learn to be not raging fire, but ember coals. How do you keep the family warm? How do you keep the fireplace warm? Okay. The Nicaraguenses have an interesting perspective on this. The Nicaraguenses say machismo is like the eucalyptus tree. It's, the roots are very deep and profound. They eat up all the vegetation around. And the fire's not very, the wood's not very good. It's too hard, can't use it, can't burn it, you know, that type of thing. And we say that the, the eucalyptus tree is also transplanted. It's not native to that area. So that's how they envision the idea of you know, where they are. We want to work with the notion of fire and helping people understand that you can manage the fire. You got fire inside that means you've got passion. You've got passion. That means you know you understand when an injustice has been done. The problem with most people who have been victimized is that we don't have a voice. We don't have the language. We don't have the words. You know something has happened to us. We know something has happened to us, but we can't say anything about it. We're helpless and we're powerless. Over it. You move from being a victim of something to becoming a survivor. That means you found a voice. You're able to now explain what happened to you, how it happened to you, and oh, by the way, it's not going to happen again. As a survivor, I learned that. The next step we say is, okay, you didn't have a voice. Now you have a voice. Now what are you going to do with the voice? How are you going to help others in terms of their 
whatever it is, for victims, how to stand up for themselves. For offenders who happen to be uh, violent, how are you going to help other men stop the violence? So the idea is to work through understanding the fire and understanding how it can be uh, uh, warming, not burning others. For women, the, uh, the ancient concept is that they're water. They are water bearers. They nurture and keep us uh, uh, balanced and nourished. But what happens? What happens when the water gets polluted? What happens when people are using substances? What happens in their victimization? They find ways of numbing themselves or going from poor relationship to poor relationship. And what I found in women's work and victims' work is uh, I've developed a model for working with, the, with women who, um, who learn about their victimization, learn to develop a voice about it, got all the resources and classes ready for themselves. But those that were prepared to do the trauma work, we did EMDR with, uh, with those women. That group of women that were, that were able to do a residential treatment, EMDR, compared to the other uh, women in treatment, seemed to be significantly different. They were much more integrated in terms of themselves. They could explain the situations that happened to them. They had a better understanding of their impairment in their attachments and were better prepared to be able to attach to their children. How do you take a chemically dependent victim of domestic violence who has had poor attachments in her upbringing, being abandoned, being neglected, being abused, maybe even work the streets in terms of being a prostitute, and help her to try to be more connected to her children? So part of the grief work had to do with part of the EMDR, EMDR processing had to do with their own personal abandonment and seeing the repetition of the generation manifest itself with their own children and making a commitment to change that. That seemed to be very, very significant. So taking responsibility for what it means to be, uh, to be a nurturer, how do I nurture myself, how do I take care of myself. And these women really were in a better position to pick better next time. They weren't in a place where they were going to be easily traumatized again. You know, they're pretty ferocious themselves. So uh, that's what we've been able to find. And the, the most important thing about the work, I think, with, that we have found with the men uh, uh, and the women, it really has to do with what kind of parents they're going to be. I know you do a lot of fatherhood work here in Alternatives to Violence. Uh, we have learned from the Mexican group, uh, they were called Coriac, they're now called uh, uh, Hombres por la Equidad, Men for Equality, that, uh, that it really is important to get from the children how the children perceive their fathers. How is it that I see how my father is, and uh, how do I feel when I'm around him? So the, the uh, children have drawn pictures, we use the pictures, and we you know, portray them, and we you know, share them with the men. Uh, very early on in the treatment, very, very early on, we start doing the fatherhood business and we ask them, uh, you know, how, how it feels to them that their children see them as Jekyll and Hyde. How it, does it feel to them to see a child not having a voice or living in the shadow of his father's, uh, living in his father's shadow? Uh, what's it feel like to him when a child, irrespective of the violence and irrespective of the dysfunction, and the chaos in the house still sees him as, he's my daddy, he's my hero, you know, I still look up to him. And then, given that perception, what do you want to do about it? So then men are motivated. I like the technique that you all use here, which is to have the men introduce their children to the group. I think that's a very powerful process, and I think it really requires the men to really learn something about their children. That seems to be, out of all the work that's happened in the last 30 years of family violence, the key, I think, to engaging men uh, and uh, women uh, in successful uh, treatment strategies because they see where they've learned, they see what's happened over the generations, they've got their own children, they don't have the skills, they want to develop the skills and are willing to engage. Now, who wants to be a drug addict? Nobody. Who wants to be a batterer? Nobody. Who wants to be a victim of domestic violence? Who wants to be a better parent? Everybody. 
So it's almost like, you know, kind of a place that we've all arrived at it in the same way. You know, you're way over here in Europe, we're over there in the United States, you know, down there in Mexico, and even in Maori land, in New Zealand, that we've arrived at the same, you know, type of place where that seems to be the situation that motivates people. So again, the sacredness of relationships, how do I develop a relationship with myself? How do I develop it with my partner? How do I develop it with my children? What work do I need to take responsibility for? And I really believe that there needs to be some accountability, that, that people who have been violent, who have been abusive to others, acknowledge the violence and the harm they've caused others. And that when the other people in the family are ready to forgive them, that that process happens. And there are strategies for being able to do that. But I think, uh, I think the first step is, you know, acknowledgement I have harmed somebody. Uh, I don't want to keep passing this generation of violence or dysfunction on. Uh, what do I need to learn in order to make that happen? How do I learn to reduce my raging fire and become Ember Coles? How do I become more protective? And how do I learn to be caring? How do I learn to be affectionate? How do I learn to not be frightened? And I know that in my own process, that was the most frightening thing of all. I went through therapeutic communities. I went through, I ate psychotherapists for breakfast. You know, I went to priests. I went to counseling programs. I went to group therapies. I went to encounter groups. But the most frightening thing for me was I went to the Bradshaw Center for Creative Growth. And all of us people from dysfunctional families meet in these group sessions and one day they turned on the lights and they gave us all teddy bears and blankets. So lay down on the floor, hug your teddy and cover yourself with a blanket. Whoa, that scared me. That frightened me. I never had anybody touch me in a good way, in a soothing, safe way. I was just wondering, how do you work with the men to reach that acknowledgement? Do you work specifically with the episodes of violence, or okay? Yeah. No, no. You have to. You, you gotta call it what it is. Mm. Let's not. Let's not dance around mm. it. You know, you're violent. Mm. Why are you, how are you violent? When are you violent? Different people do different things. Mm. Some people do psychodramas around the violence. Mm. Man alive and. In San Francisco, they actually act out the violence. Okay. And the group says, ah, you're there, and ah, you're not there, you're fooling around. Mm -hmm. okay? Other people say, you know, explain to us what happens. When do you get triggered? Mm -hmm. Some people use cognitive behavioral approaches. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the triggers? What are the stimulus? You know, what are you thinking? Uh, what do you feel about it? And how do you decide to become violent? Mm -hmm. So all the violent cessation technology you have to incorporate okay. to help that. But more importantly, what, is it, what does it take? What motivates the person to be able to decide that they want yes. to do it? You know, we talk about mandated treatment. Six months it takes these guys to get beyond it. Sex offenders never agree, you know, to take responsibility. I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Or, 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 or it was my hands. My hands touched me. It wasn't me. It was my hands. So when do you, you know, when do you take responsibility for your hands are? You know, I mean, it, it seems ridiculous, but this is what happens with this kind of population. Mm -hmm. People that are mandated into treatment, you know, mm -hmm. even with a conviction, mm -hmm. don't necessarily take responsibility mm -hmm. for it. Another question? Somebody else had a hand up here? No? Okay. Just one more question. Yeah. I was wondering if you get into the sexual violence, uh, or is, is that difficult? I, I think for the taboo? sexual, I mean, it's really taboo. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the, even for the physical, Every group, they're supposed to uh, take responsibility for this is my violence. This is mm -hmm. what I did. Every, and you will some hear mm -hmm. some of them for 52 weeks say the exact same thing mm -hmm. and never take responsibility for, you know, a lot of other violence. So the sexual is even less talked mm -hmm. about. Um, for example, I just had a guy last week who he's been there 30 weeks, and he was actually in my group for he raped his um, prostitute, he was pimping her out. And so I says, you know, Michael, you really need to stop dancing around this, dancing around what really happened, because I think we all know what happened. Um, he wouldn't say it in front of me, being a woman. 
and I had left the group for two, three months. I don't, I, I, I think, um, I don't know, I just had a break and I came back. But I had known about this, but he didn't know I had known, so I finally says, why don't you just say what happened? Well, when I called him on it, he turned, and then it was all, yeah, I'm a pimp, and I'll pimp my mom off if I have to. But it was very much still like, I'm gonna, you wanna know? I'll show you what I know. And instead of saying, you know, I'm sorry, I'm remorseful, this is, he turned to the pimp. And I says, you know, I just wonder why you were dancing around this. I, it's taken 12 weeks, I've come back for group. And really, he doesn't know the other way of taking responsibility other than, hey, I'm the pimp, okay? Get over it. And then after group, he says, um, he shakes my hand every, every time after group, and he says, don't think bad of me, okay? And I says, you know, Michael, it's not about me. It's about you and your violence. So the sexual part is really, really, I have to say, minimized. And, and that needs to get you know brought out by the partner some kind of way. And there's an odd, there's been forever an ongoing discussion in the mm -hmm. domestic violence field. Do you uh, include the partner? Do you put her at risk? Do you place her you know in jeopardy? How do you get you know information? How do you know a guy's changed? Mm -hmm. How do you know you know he says oh I, I, I'm not I'm not you know I, we published a a, a family therapy a case <coughs> in the Journal of Inter American Psychology, Dr. Flores and myself. He was Nicaragüense, uh, Somosista, had fought during the Civil War, had been a, a sergeant in the, in the Army. Uh, both uh, him and his wife had parents that were in the military, so this is a very long, extended, uh, intergenerational pattern of, of being in the military. He comes and migrates to this country. There he has power, there he has authority, there he has privilege. Here he's washing dishes. Here he's a janitor. So one day, they arrested him because he was in front of his house with a 30 odd six pointing at, you know, the front door of his family flat, ranting and raving about needing to protect the government from the Sandinista spies. His wife and four children, in his mind, were the Sandinista spies. So that's how I get him into treatment. He's actively cocaine uh, using, he's alcoholic, and he's domestically violent, lethally domestically violent. So we get him in, we detox him, we get him in the program, you know, nice guy, quiet guy, you know, pleasant guy to be around, doesn't say too much about anything, bring in the wife, bring in the children, and the wife says, oh, you know, he does this, he does that, he holds us hostage, he doesn't let him go to the bathroom, and, you know, we've had to stay, and, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, he's doing this now? I think he's, you know, and we're doing a good job for six months, and now his wife is telling us he's still actively battering or still actively holding them hostage. Well, the reality of the fact was he had stopped the violence, but not only had she been victimized by her husband, but she had been victimized, you know, in by her, you know, neglectful father, whose wife died of cancer and remarried, and the stepmother had been abusive to her. So her perception, you know, of the abuse was very heightened. And so there was a dance that they did. So part of the work required really clarifying the intergenerational pattern of how they had learned the violence, number one. Number two, he had taken responsibility for stopping the violence and for, um, and for uh, being active in Alcoholics Anonymous. So he was clean and sober. They came into family therapy, and the family therapist uh, asked, uh, asked them something about their sleeping arrangements. You know how it is in family therapy. You get all the juicy stories, right, in family therapy. So, uh, so we come to find out they haven't slept in the same bed for six years. So the family, uh, so Yvette says uh, to the woman, well, what seems to be the problem? Why don't you sleep together? And she says, well, uh, he answers for her. Oh, my wife is sick. She has, you know, these problems. Well, what problems? What's the diagnosis? What have been lab results? What have you found out? Well, there are a lot of vague complaints. And finally, the woman says in Spanish, this is my body, and I will give it to him when I'm good and ready. Okay. Now, you guys are familiar with Naj, Naj's work, intergenerational uh, work. Are you familiar with some of that? Yeah. Okay, so Naj believes in this notion called relation, 
relational justice, which is that you have to be accountable for the pluses and minuses in your relationships. And so she says to him, I will give him my body when I'm good and ready. So now Frank knows that it's up to his wife to decide when they're going to have sex again. Right? So if he wants to have a relationship with his wife, there are certain things he's going to have to learn how to do. I want him to wash the dishes. I want him to help raise my children. I want him to be present in the house. I don't want him to be violent again. Okay? Those are examples of what's going on. One of the things that happened in this particular family was Frank was taken to Bordello when he was 11 years old by his father. That was kind of like the family pattern. So the more favorite child, Frank Jr., right, he was taken to the Bordello for a long time and had this private you know, relationship. Uh, same passing on the same pattern. So he had to decide to do something different. So the family was engaged in therapy. They stopped the violence. This was a family that had survived the uh, earthquake in Nicaragua. They were civil servants. They had survived the migration to the United States. They had survived the civil war in Nicaragua. They were not going to split up, ladies and gentlemen. This was going to be a family that was going to stay together. The question is, how do we get them to get together? So Frank did his part. His wife did his part. They went and got uh, citizenship classes. I saw Frank a couple of years later in Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I said, hey, Frank, how you doing? Hey, good, good, good. How's it going, you and your wife? So you don't sleep, no, two years. Two years later, four years, another AA meeting. Hey, Frank, how's it going? You and your wife? <laughs> Six years later, right, passing him on the street. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Doctor, how you doing? <laughs> But she says, she says, I put up with you for 20 years of domestic violence, and I'll let you know when I'm ready. And so I think part of the recovery, if you can get people into this place, is people have to lay it on the table. What are the plus and minuses? What are the carga? How are you going to pay off the balance? How are you going to pay it off? When you were abusive, you were neglectful, you spent all the money. You know, people go into treatment for alcoholism. And they go to the treatment, they come out, they go to this res they go to your residential treatment program over there, they come out clean and sober, and every and he says, Hey, I'll clean and sober. Everyone says, So what? So what? You weren't here when you were a drunk, you weren't here when you were in treatment. And now you want to be my husband? Now you want to be my father? Now you want to be my friend? I don't think so. So what is it going to take? And unless we dialogue, unless we explain it, unless we lay it out, you don't know when the debt is paid. So part of the recovery process really requires that you do that, especially when there's been, been victimization. And I found that that seems to be in a workable situation because you've got the entire family participating in how you pay off the debt. And so people don't have to carry it. Okay, any other thoughts, questions? We've got a few more minutes. Yeah. Yes. Um, the uh, truth and reconciliation and forgiveness. Right. What sort of um, role can they play in your, your work? Well, I don't think we have a, a formalized process like they did in South Africa, but I think the concepts are the same. I think you have to acknowledge what you've, uh, the harm that you've committed. You have to make, take responsibility for being safe. And people who have post-traumatic stress or have you know, uh, traumatized backgrounds have to take responsibilities for their own neurochemistry, their own psychology and their behavior. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is what does the family, as I just explained with this vignette, what does the family need from that person to be able to be assured of their safety? Now, you can't make the family responsible for his violence, nor can you make the family responsible for his addiction. But together, the family can be very helpful in identifying 
high risk situations. So you can really incorporate relapse prevention strategies. If a child begins to get frightened because the voice is getting too loud, if the wife begins to withdraw because she's not sure, she just senses something isn't right, that that really becomes a family uh, process of identification and talking about that and saying, hey, maybe it's time to take a time out, Dad. You know, maybe it's time we you know, do something else you know, so we don't get to that place so that people can really work on doing that together. So the process in some ways is the same. You acknowledge the violence. You take responsibility for what, you, what your part is. And everyone works on maintaining some safety. Now, I'd love to hear from anyone who knows what's happening in South Africa if this process actually worked in that entire country, in that entire society. Did people heal from the racism and the violence that occurred to them? I don't know. I'd love to, I'd love to uh, hear about that. I just know that with family work and individual work, you can make that happen, but you have to expand it to the community, you have to expand it to their own neighborhoods in order for that to feel safe. South Africa also had the 5-1 campaign. For every one man that was violent, there were four or five that were not. You know, I've heard that's had some success, but I haven't heard lately, you know. Any other questions? Yes? When you work with uh, men and women like this, there must be some limits to where you would recommend reconciliation, that the couple should Absolutely. continue together. What Safety, not? safety first and foremost. There are some couples, some relationships uh, that should be together. You know, there's something that happens between two people. That there's not to shift, not to put blame on anybody. It's just the dance that they do. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Daniel Amend. Any of you people familiar with the, uh, your body, your uh, your brain, uh, feed your brain, feed your body, something like that. He's done a lot of research on using spec studies, single emission photon tomographies, scans the brains, okay? He's a psychiatrist who's been in private practice for many years now, 20 years, he's got 50,000 brain scans. And he's got a new book out called The Brain and Love. Kind of an interesting uh, topic because it talks about this particular issue. A couple comes in to see him, they can't get along. They're fighting with each other. They're chronically, you know, dysfunctional. He can't stand coming to the therapy. He says, you know, I'm a lousy therapist, lousy psychiatrist. I'm going to stop doing this work. So he says, can I scan your brains? Well, that's not bad because it's a $3,500 deal, right? You know, for each one of them. So that's $7,000. So instead of them paying $7,000, he scans their brains and sees, in fact, what seems to be the problem. Overactive cingulate gyrus, which is obsessive compulsive thinking all the time, with an underactive frontal lobe, you know, on his part. Uh, nobody had ever. It's a man of color healing the wounded male spirit.